So good morning, everybody. You're going to have to hear my voice a lot today. I think I've got three or three and a half hours of talking, so I apologize in advance if I'm putting people to sleep, but I will try my best not to. And a lot of the stuff you're going to hear what I'm going to talk about today, you've heard parts of over the last couple of days. You're going to hear some more probably on, on tomorrow also. And there's some things I'm going to probably say a few times in here also, and that's because it's important. I want you guys to make sure you remember th those items because they are there. There's obviously some key key tenants to what we do in this. So we'll go ahead and get started with foundation design this morning. So our our objectives is going to be, you know, we're going to define what is foundation design, what what is encompassed by that. Um, we're going to talk about a bunch of different uh, preparation methods and also improvement methods. Um, there, we can you want to prepare that surface, but you also there's ways we can improve what's below the surface to uh, g give you a better foundation to put that dam on or rehab that dam that's on it. Uh, we're going to go into uh, different seepage control methods and spend a fair amount of time on, on the seepage side of it. So foundation design, this is really integral with embankment design. This is not a, a separate sideshow on your design. It's got to be tied right in with your embankment design because they, they go together and you have a lot of a lot of failure modes that happen either in the foundation or at the contact or the foundation projects them up into the embankment. And site characterization is key. I, I know you talked about that on Monday, but I, I can't stress that enough. I'm gonna say that several times today. It is really important to understand your site, understand what conditions are controlling your problems, what where where your risks are, where your concerns are, and, and, and fully understand those. Because, because if you don't, you run the risk of putting the wrong design in or not doing the correct design or not taking a feature to a large enough extent. So you really got to understand that, that foundation and your site to, to do this properly. And the, the analysis we work with, most of it's seepage. There's, all, there's also settlement concerns and, and your foundation has issues with slope stability too, with you know, how does that, if you have low, low strength in your foundation, if there's you know, sometimes in your cemetery layers, maybe you're in a shale, you got bentonite layers. So there's, there's lots of things that go into this and it's what nature gave us. You know, the embankment, we control it. It's an engineered product. You know, we have controls on that. We, we can do a pretty good job of building an embankment. There, are, there will still be defects because we're always, the things get missed, things are inadvertent. But the foundation, you're trying to adjust to what you have out on that site. So you've, it, it just takes, there's, there's more thought to it and, and planning that needs to go into it. So what does foundation design include? Well, service and subsurface treatment. So again, how do we prepare it? How do we improve it? Controlling seepage, you know, that's, that's one of the big things. If you can control the water, you can usually control whatever problems you're gonna have in your foundation and that projects up into the embankment too. You know, our strength, is it strong enough? Is, does it have enough bearing? Um, do, we have, do we have to make really flat slopes or can we do improvements? You know, there's you get different ways you can look at that. Settlement, this is, this is a big one, differential settlement. That, that brings a lot, of, a lot of problems in embankment dams, this differential settlement. And a lot of it's tied because the foundation wasn't appropriately prepared, treated, shaped. And if you do a good job of foundation treatment, it protects your embankment. It, it takes risks off the table. It makes it a safer, robust, more resilient feature. And as I said, it's, we're dealing with what nature gave us. So the, the features are, are numerous and maybe sometimes overwhelming if you have really bad sites, if you have a lot of different geologic conditions or you know, karst conditions, you know, steep valleys, stress relief. There's just lots of problems that get into this. So your, your design features, they need to be robust and redundant. They gotta be, they gotta be big. They gotta be able to handle the different conditions you have. You've gotta have redundancy in them. Are they, are they you know, is a filter thick enough to handle whatever issues you may have with that foundation? Uh, is your grout curtain, resilient enough? Is it, is it tr three rows versus a single row? You know, these are things that you think about when you're, when you're doing foundation design. And again, it's all based on site conditions. You can take things we're gonna show you here today. This is your toolbox, but you really gotta analyze each of the site conditions and apply the correct one for the correct problem. And then this is big. We're not, gonna, we're not really getting into contract documents in this course, but, but having ways in your, con your construction contract to address changes quickly and efficiently. So you, in other words, you're, you're building in other optional items or you know, there, there's, there's ways in that contract so that if you're finding changes in construction with that foundation when you expose it, you can address them because it it's, it's goes, your foundation design is 
going on throughout your whole project. And expect the unexpected. I know that's kind of a silly thing to say. Um, you know, it's the unknowns, unknowns. So again, it's, it's thinking about what problems could we have, you know, looking at, you know, other dams that have similar foundation conditions. And there's, there's, there's papers published all over on different dams and different foundations and say, what did, what problems did they have? What did they experience? How do they treat them? Did it work or not? Okay. How do we learn off of that? So there's, there's a great body of evidence out there to, to help you build a correct design for your foundation. So some potential failure modes that foundations can cause. So th these are just a few examples. There's, there's a lot of them. Um, so concentrated leak erosion. So that's where we're, we're getting some sort of opening and we're getting water moving through there and, and eroding. So you can get it down here at the bottom at the fill bedrock contact. If you don't have good treatment, um, if you've got a, you know, maybe when you, you prepared this, there was a, a slime layer or you can start erosion there. Uh, abutment contacts is you're going up a steeper abutment. You can't get good compaction on it. So maybe you've got some, some softer material in here that, that can erode and cause you problems. Um, you can also get arching, you know, in these steep abutments. I think that was talked about maybe by Brian yesterday, um, where the normal stress is just, it's arching across this, this little, this steep change in slope. So you're getting a low density zone. You can uh, hydraulically fracture it and, and move particles. These are all tied to the foundation. And then you can get embankment cracking, cracking where you have changes in foundation profiles, where it's, it's steep and it, this may be higher up in the dam, but it's, it's, still, it's still a risk and it's tied to this foundation profile change. And you know, I, I ascertain a lot, of the, a lot of your embankment PFMs have something to do with that foundation in one way or another. Um, there's some embankment ones that are just truly embankment, but a lot of them you'll see over the course of the day are tied to foundations. So valley stress relief, this is a common problem more so when you have sedimentary bedrock materials because the original ground was coming across right here at the top the river cut down well nature wants to fill in voids so the sides i should use this so people go back and see the sides are gonna they want to actually relax into the valley bottom so that's what's kind of this is showing you've, you've got these stress relief cracks these vertical valley stress relief cracks that open up as the sides come in so now you've got a through going upstream to downstream crack, not a good scenario. Uh, on the, you know, if you're sedimentary, you've got, as it's moving, it's probably gonna move along uh, weaker bedding planes horizontally. And then also the bottom, you know, again, it's trying to, it's relaxing. You get relax, relaxation on the bottom where the, the valley bottom can come up. This is all forming different sorts of faults, joints, cracks, fractures uh, that, that give you pathways that you have to worry about from a seepage standpoint and from a treatment standpoint. So there, again, you just step back and think what has happened geologically history rated, geologic history rated on this, on our sites, what could have happened here and we, how, do, how do we investigate it? How do we find the problems and then how do we treat them? And then karst topography, this is its, its, its own little beast and for a good chunk of our country. And you guys have the slides, but we'll, we'll kind of step through this. You already see, you see, you've seen the end game. So we're just saying we're going to go out and we're going to do an investigation for a, for, for a new dam site. We've got a valley bottom here. Maybe there's a river channel right in here. And say, okay, we're going to do some mapping. We're going to say, we're going to put in some borings just at these locations to figure out what's going on. Try to understand what we're seeing. And you see a little bit here. And this is just to get you to think about, you know, when you're drilling a boring, you know, you're, you're looking at something, you know, that big around. And I think it was Dave Rogers one time did the math saying, you know, if you do a, you know, what's considered an adequate exploration, you're seeing, I think, around one millionth of the foundation of your area. So you're seeing a really small portion of what's going on in the subsurface. And you're trying to make interpretations there. And that's, again, why that site characterization is key, understanding the geologic principles, you know, what is going on from a sedimentation, from tectonics, you know, folding, faulting. So here we're, we've, we've got some data back. Um, if you're seeing the black, you know, we've got some solution cavities in here. The stippled part, we're seeing infillings. Okay, that something's gone. It's been backfilled with um, some, some sediment. Uh, maybe there's some good, good rock right in here. Some infilling, we get down to good rocks. It's like, yeah, this, this isn't looking that great. And then if you were able to strip it all away, you say, well, wow, there's a, there's a lot going on here. So we've got big solution cavities here in the middle. That you you kind of saw those. Here we saw filling down to bedrock. So, okay, maybe there's a good bedrock here. 
this one's at oh good back bedrock all the way, but you got voids over here, you got infilling over here, and then more infilling, and you're hitting rocks, which just you're not seeing. And then this this keeps trailing down here. You got all these cavities here and down here that you're not even picking up. You didn't catch this fault that's got big void openings in here. And and this condition, karst conditions are, are are rough. And the, the Corps of Engineers has has done a lot of rehabs in the last. 40 years, 40, 42 years, 45 years on, on dams, you know, in, in the Midwest that are on, on limestones, dolomites that, that do, that are soluble. And this, this is a, a definitely a, a real concern. It's something that we're still dealing with. And it's just, it's again, it's just hard to see what's going on there. That's where this robust and, and redundant, resilient design comes in. So some, some, some thoughts on foundation design. You know, you, you want to you can come up with great designs, but you also got to make sure that they work with the construction processes that are going to happen out there. You know, and you, and what you know from an economy scale, how how can you do things that are are efficient? Because you know we're not cleaning the foundation off. Um, there's a lot of hand labor into it, but but you still have large mechanical equipment that's doing most of your work. So you've got to think about okay, what features am I putting in so that I can I can get this done, get it done safely but also think about how is a contractor going to do it? How do we actually build this? How do we finish it off to, to make it a, a complete project? And as I said earlier, design continues through construction. So, you know, you've got your design, once you send off and you bid on it, you're still doing work throughout the construction phase when that foundation is getting exposed. Because, you know, as in the last slide we looked at, you don't see everything. You know, your, your, your greatest exploration is when you're, when you're doing that foundation prep for the dam, when you're doing that core trench or, or whatever you're working on, because then you're actually seeing everything. And the hope is you have you had enough information, you've got enough experience, enough reviews, and you, you thought through what could go wrong, and you've got those in your contract, so you are just, you're just adapting to what you're seeing out there, but everything's going smooth. That's not always the case. There are definitely situations where things, unexpected things happened, or unexpected things popped up that, you know, between two borings. You know, and I, I know of a case history where they, they were doing grouting. And they did quite a few investigations along the center line of the dam. And they had one hole that had quite a bit of take. All the rest were low take. And that one hole was kind of just right off the valley bottom. But when they got into uh, production, that one hole represented about 30% of the foundation. And I think their grouting cost increased by a factor of 10 because of that one small area, because they didn't quite understand what was going on with that valley stress relief. So. Not trying to scare people, but you know, it's, it's just again understanding, making sure you've got enough, you know, probably trained, you know, geotech engineers and geologists to really understand your foundations, because they did get it right in construction, but it was a lot more cost in construction because that is your last chance. So you got to treat construction as you're still moving through it; it's still a design. So we can still get it right in construction. We just got to make sure we take that time to get it get it done right. And this is. I think this is a, from, from Peck, this last one here, is that, you know, difficulties are most often result because inadequate judgment was brought to bear upon the problem. So making sure, you know, you guys are all learning out here. You probably got more senior people in your organization that maybe have seen and done this. It's getting the right people to look at this and understand what you're doing because there are, there are risks there. And again, this is our last chance to get it right. And, you know, there's, there's things that we're looking at that were done 50, 70 years ago. Like, wow, why'd they do that? Well, they thought that was the best standard of care at the time. And we'll do things today that people from 50 years from now will say, why'd they do that? Well, we thought it was what was the best thing to do. So, you know, it, it's easy to look back in time and judge people poorly, but that's, that's what they knew. But what we can do is figure out what problems they had, learn from them, and adapt from them so we don't have them now. We'll have our own problems that will be identified in the future, but keep learning from what we've, what we've done. So now we've got a, I've got a Socrative quiz up here. So if we could get that fired up. So here's the, here's the question. So which of the following materials are used in foundation treatment? And this is a select all that apply. So there's, we got five up here, dental concrete, high mobility grout, slushies, leveling concrete, and low mobility grout. So some foundation, foundation prep pertinent references. Uh, this one from USSD, this is Still in draft form, unfortunately. I thought it'd be published by now. This is something I've been working with on with uh, Doug Boyer from FERC for quite some time. And it actually, the original draft, I think, was started in the 90s. So it, it's got a long life that just needs to be published. When it does finally come out, it, it is a good document. Um, it also references pretty heavy this Bureau of Reclamation um, Foundation Surface 
treatment chapter three, which is a, which is a good document. It really steps you through what you should be thinking about for uh, foundation preparation. This is that surface treatment, um, not getting below the surface, just what we're doing at the surface. And then reclamation also has an engineering geology field manual that last was published, I think, in the in the nineties. It's a it's a good reference. So they're little little books you actually take out in the field. If you don't have them in your library, I strongly recommend getting them. They're they're good, and I think you can download them. Um, for, for free off of Reclamation's website. So foundation preparation for, for your core and your filters, you know, your, your water um, barrier and your seepage and collection system, foundation preparation is required and essential. Um, that, that's just, it's just, you just do it. There's no getting around it for your core and your filters. So the first step is you, you clean it. You remove all the loose material, uh, get down to your, your, your firm, your, your subgrade, which generally is bedrock, but some, for some dams it's actually soil. You, you do your shaping. So I talked earlier about, you know, we've got, you know, where you worry about cracking and, and, and um, stress really, not stress really, you worry about cracking and uh, the slope of that foundation. Sorry, the words, the words <laughs> skipping me right now. And then you start putting in these different treatments. You do dental concrete if you got to fill in in low spots, again, get the smooth foundation. And then uh, after dental concrete, you know, you, you can also do shaping, do some excavation to remove those. You protect, protect it from, if you have a sedimentary material, a, a fine grain material that's prone to slaking. So when, when air hits it, does it degrade? You gotta protect it from slaking. That's usually something you do within hours of exposing the foundation. And then slush grout, to cover your highly jointed areas. This is a, this is a uh, high mobility grout. You can fill in small areas. And then shear and fault treatment. That's a much more, uh, a bigger, more invasive uh, type of, of, of work you need to do. And then for the shells on the outside, um, you still need to do some shaping, and that's more so for the, the construction. So you can get equipment in there to appropriately place and compact the materials. On the downstream side, you wanna make sure, you, that this is me going up against your filters and drains. So you've got appropriate you know, shaping, they, they tie together well. And then your foundation for your shells and your soil is usually just Scarification, you know, open it up, put some water in it, recompact it, um, do some proof rolling, make sure you've got, again, a firm, solid foundation that you're working off of. And then, as I said earlier, make sure you've got adequate measuring and contract to address changes, because there will be changes. It's not an if, there will be changes. So when you're dealing, dealing with soil, soil foundations, and, and even this first one applies to bedrock too, you really want to do everything that dries. So you want to have control of that water. You want to have a good dewatering system um, so that you can do your work in the dry. You know, you kind of air quotes dry. There, there could be little, little isolated seeps coming in here or there that you control with point, point, point dewatering, but most of the part your excavation is dry. You want to get out any compressible, fissured or desiccated materials because um, the compressible obviously have settlement concerns, could be different settlement. Uh, fissured and desiccated, same concerns, more, more um, we're on a settlement side because you've got voids that are, gonna, that are going to close when you put load on them. So you want to make sure those are either removed or treated appropriately. Because if you'll have settlement, you could also have stability concerns with. Again, shaping that foundation, same as we did for the shells for constructability so we can get everything in there. Get, get, your, get the loose soil off there. We're not saying on a soil foundation you're going out there with air and cleaning it off, but you want it proof rolled and you want a good, good firm foundation. Extensive cleaning is not required for soil typically because you're doing that scarification, moisture condition, recompacting. You're not noticing or cleaning it, you're just preparing it. Proof rolling, get out those weak, wet, and compressible areas. You'll see them when you put that equipment over there. If, if you've got something that's yielding, you remove that and you put back in uh, acceptable material. And but make sure you know your materials are still filter compatible with your foundation. You don't want to introduce a new potential failure mode because you put in something that is not filter compatible with the foundation and you have a new problem here. So we gotta, we gotta be careful we think about we're not causing new problems. And again, scarification, make sure we have that good bond of the embankment. So shaping, this is kind of an extreme example of shaping. This is actually Teton Dam. Um, so again, we wanna make sure we, we take care of stress changes. So you look at this, here's a big shadow. So this is actually a big overhang. So you're not gonna be able to get in there. You're not gonna be able to compact it. So you're gonna, you will have a low density zone in here that water is going to attack and possibly be able to erode. So you want a good 
good shaped foundation that you can place against. You know, you're also going to get differential settlement when we've got this step here, then a vertical. Well, you, you've got a much different, I mean, there's a guy for scale. So what are we talking here? This is 30 feet tall. That's a big load change across a very short distance. You're going to get differential settlement. You're probably going to get arching in here. All those are bad things for dam foundations. And then by making it shape, shaping it, making it continuous, you can ensure your continuity of your, your core materials and your filters and your drains. And then just thinking about, okay, what is your rock type? This, this was hard stuff. They, this is, they're out there drilling and blasting this at, at Teton Dam. Um, if you have a, a softer foundation that you can rip or get at with me mechanical equipment, you, you think about, okay, what, what works best? Do I want to blast it? Can I rip it? Do I do a lot of concrete? You know, you got to think through what does your, what's your foundation allowing you to do and address it that way. So from a shaping standpoint, just some of the different things you're gonna, you could see. Um, well, we got a protrusion here, we're gonna remove that. We've got a big block missing. We're gonna backfill that with dental concrete. Holes in the bottom, we're gonna put those back with dental concrete. Maybe this is a loose block we, we removed. Here's a depression with dental concrete. Um, we've got all these uh, fractures and joints down here. Maybe we do some shallow grouting in here, some stitch grouting to, to put these back together. Anything, any areas we're missing where we might want to do some treatment that's not shown in, in blue or with a note. <coughs> this one? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's something either you're going to flatten it back or put in a, a dental concrete wedge to again give you something that you can compact against. So dental concrete, again, kind of two options. Either you're you're filling it in with concrete to give you a, a, not, a nice slope, or you're removing it. A lot of this is just determined by how hard is this to remove, I think. You know, if it's, if it's an easy material you can excavate out, that's usually going to be the more cost-effective way. And I think it's a simpler way to do it. If, you, if this is really hard rock, then you're going to come back in and do more dental concrete. Or if it's, just, you know, there's a lot of smaller areas and it's not cost-productive. So you just got to think what your, what's your foundation giving you to work with. So some shaping and cleaning for a core placement. This is a this is Isabella Dam, which this is labor intensive work. This foundation cleaning for core trenches. It is labor intensive. I mean, you're, you're, you know, he's got a shot back. <laughs> it's, you're getting in there and you're cleaning out all of this. You know, the, the kind of the, the joke in the field is like, oh, it's so clean, you can eat off of it. I mean, for people that are geologists, I'm a half geologist, so yeah, we eat dirt, so that, 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 that's okay. Um, but you're talking about hand trowels, picks, shovels, vacuums, um, jackhammers. Vacuum trucks are used quite a bit. You know, you got a shot back, but you can use a larger size of vacuum truck to kind of pull out bigger areas. Um, pressurized air and water. You've got to be careful with those, um, especially with water. If you have material that, that can slake and degrades in water, you don't want to be cleaning with water because you're going to continually be chasing your problem. Air, air is a really good one, but you got to be careful too on, on how much pressure you're using because you can start, if it's a softer foundation, you can really start digging down into it more than you really need to. So you, you've got to, again, you've got to use judgment in these. You've got to be kind of... Um, you know, from, from a water, that was an air cleaning back where this is a water cleaning. So you can see we've kind of got this muddy slope back here and they're, they're cleaning it off. This is a good, I think it's a metamorphic foundation that, 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 that held up to water. So they were actually able to clean it off. They're vacuuming some of it up. The rest gets to the bottom. We've got an excavator over here that's loading up in bags and in, buck, in, uh, not bags, in buckets, trench boxes that they're going to haul out. So again, it just depends on if your foundation can handle water treatment, you, you go with water treatment. And then this is just a, a photo of kind of the, the steps. So this, is, this is a, wasn't a very tall dam. This is about a four foot deep uh, core trench for, for bedrock. So you see you got this final excavation, ripping it up. And then back here where you've got a clean surface where they, they, they I think they used a broom and then air. And just you can see, you can see all the little steps in bedrock and that, that's really good. You've got it cleaned off. That's, that's ready for, for fill placement back there. And here's a, aerial view of kind of the whole process. This is another dam, again, not, this is about a 20 foot tall dam, so not a huge core trench in it. But you've got the, the rough excavation. He's, 
This one's getting it down to, you know, within probably inches of final grade. And then there's another little skid steer here that, that cleans up, smooths it off, levels everything off. And then another one that's just got a broom. And he's, their roll, everything is moving towards this excavator. You just keep moving it, and the excavator will muck it out of the way. And then finally, you've got, these are, these are, two, these are air compressors back here. They had two of them. And they, there's just one person here, but they had a team that was cleaning back here. You can see it's, it's shiny. I mean, they've got it cleaned off. It's ready for fill placement. And then back here, they're actually this darker color. They're actually doing fill placement. And then this tan is the filter sand. So you're seeing kind of the whole operation. This foundation did, did have slaking concerns. So there was a requirement where once you got to this point, you exposed it, you've got to get it covered with fill within 12 hours. And that's two foot of fill. Otherwise, we would have slaking and we'd have to come back and reclean it. So that needs to be clear in your contract documents. Really got to talk a lot to the contractor about this and say, here's, here's, we're going to hold you to this. So you make sure you understand, don't get too, don't get too, you know, don't have this guy digging way down over here and get out in front of you because you're going to come back and you're going to dig more because you're, it's going to slake. We're going to have to go back and clean it. You have to re-prepare re it. So it, it, things, things to think about. So dental concrete, uh, for big and smaller you know, applications. Here we're just doing filling some smaller voids. Here we've got actually, this is a, some fault treatment here, a pretty good size area that again, just comes out of a ready mix truck. Uh, this is usually 4,000, 3,000 PSI concrete to fill these voids, smooth off surfaces. You do gotta make sure that you protect it. Um, just like any other concrete, it's gotta cure. So you've gotta protect it. You've gotta do the, the right treatment for it. it just to make sure you, again, you've got that good foundation. So a little more finer detailed uh, slush grout. This is a, a two inch void or less. That's usually what you use slush grout for. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty fluid mix that can, that can fill cracks. And then this is a, some fault treatment over here. You can see the gouge right in here. They're, they're digging it out. And the, the table down here, this is from Reclamation. And it, it's their guidance as to how wide, based on the width of the feature, how deep you go, and what type of material you use to backfill it. And there's different iterations of this table from different sources, different references. And you need to uh, you know, bear judgment as to what's appropriate, especially when you get down to this bottom one. You know, these greater than five foot wide features. This is three times the width. Well, that could be 15 feet deep. You know, think about taking an <laughs> excavation like this 15 feet down. So there, there, there's definitely some limitations to this. And, and, and safety comes into play because you're getting people in there because this is all labor intensive. So it's got to be safe excavation. Uh, again, you want to make sure we've got this all sealed up and we've got a good foundation. You're addressing seepage concerns. You're not leaving defects in that foundation. So some other considerations for dewatering and seepage control. Typically, you want to do stuff with wells and well points as much as possible uh, because you want to maintain that water below your foundation. So once it starts getting to the foundation, it can start degrading it. And if you have a soil foundation, you start worried about it's going to start pumping. Are you potential migration of fines, internal erosion? So you want to try to keep that water down. You still have to use sumps and ditches because there's going to be point locations you're going to have to address um, individually. And make sure you don't have a loss of ground. That's why that, keeping that water down, you don't have a loss of ground. You don't get quick conditions. I already talked about slaking. Again, protecting them. 12 hours. Either you back them with 12 hours or you put a mud mat, which is a, a low strength concrete. And that's usually maybe a few inches thick. And that mud mats are used a lot below. So your initial lift of your core, your, your low permeability fill on, on an abutment. That's what we're looking at here. Here's, here's the valley bottom. The dam's coming back up. This is, well, generally speaking, you place your core wet of optimum anyways. You want something that's plastic, that's flexible, that's going to really knead into all the features. You know, it's, this is a little undulating, but so you want to be able to really be able to pack that in there. And a, a wet of optimum material allows you to do that. Your first couple of feet, it's usually called a specially compacted. You're doing it with a rubber tired equipment, which is not what you want to do for mass excavation. You want to, like for clay, you want a sheep's foot, a sheep's foot out there to, to uh, shear it and, and compact it. But for those first two feet, you use a rubber tire because it can roll into the roll it in much better on that foundation. And you also got to be careful, depending if you have a weaker foundation, a sedimentary foundation, you don't want to put tracked equipment on it. 
because that will actually fracture the foundation. So you spend all this time cleaning this thing off, getting it to a firm foundation, and you drive a dozer across it, and now you've fractured it four, six, eight inches down. You've got to start over. So you're thinking about what equipment works to not damage things going forward. So foundation strengthening. So we've talked, all this we're talking about right now has been that cleaning, that preparation, that surface prep. Now we're, we're going to talk about, okay, what can we do below that surface? Can we, can we improve it? Um, can we increase density? Can we increase strength? Do we add structural members so that it um, can hold up better? Reduce the, the reduced collapse potential. So this is, this is something more so in the Western U.S. You've got a lot of windblown um, silts that are put down a very low density, they can hydro collapse. You gotta either remove those or densify them or take care of them in some manner. So consider impacts the embankment and foundation. And if your foundation condition, you may some of these, can, can those concerns. And I think I've kind of already mentioned this, but, but be careful with what, what you pay for foundation strengthening. This is kind of a, a slippery slope because you don't want to introduce new failure modes that don't currently exist. Because some of these, a lot of these foundation strengthening methods are pretty invasive and we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're not making things worse. And so a lot of the things on this slide, for the most part, they really apply, if you're going to use them to the shells of the bank, but not to the core. The core usually you're getting down to bedrock and you're, you're doing treatment. Um, so dynamic compaction, this first one up here, you know, you're just dropping a weight and you're trying to densify materials. Okay, what could that cause problems in the future for you? You know, okay, we've got density here. Generally, your whole body's getting denser, but you've got higher and lower density zones. Is that going to be, is, could that cause issues? Uh, wick drains here in the center photo. Uh, those help if you have uh, consolidation issues. They can help get the water out faster. But you know, you've just put in a whole bunch of penetration. It's a high pressure uh, jet that erodes the foundation. So you think of dams, you think of erosion and foundations not really go together. Um, and I'm gonna mention jet grinding a few times, but you really gotta be careful, careful with using it. You know, again, get, don't, make, don't make things worse. And then pre-wetting, you know, if you have collapse potentials, if you can pre-wet it and compact it, maybe you can uh, take some of that collapse out of it. So this is what jet grinding looks like. You actually just drill down and then you've got this, these high pressure jets that erode out the foundation and re you replace it with a, with a cement material. This is what they look like after the fact. Um, they're not, it's not used that much in dams. It is used in, in, in levee, like closure, closure sections um, because of this risk. And, and the technology has come a long ways in the last, I'd say 15, 20 years where they've got some lower pressures on them, but it's still pressures that could hydraulically fracture if not done right or if you have the wrong ground conditions. So use jet grouting with caution. So another um, option is just remove and replace. And, and, and this actually can work on a lot of foundations, because especially with modern moving, earth moving equipment, you can, you can move a lot of earth really fast and you can just take care of your problem, put in a, a correct engineered fill and, and it kind of goes away. So foundation seepage control, so barrier walls. Some of the benefits of this, it's gonna reduce water loss. That's not necessarily a damn safety thing, but that is uh, something that water providers are really, really tied into. Um, it interrupts internal erosion. So if you've got a foundation that's got backward erosion piping issues, it interrupts that, it, it, it can arrest that. It, it, it's not gonna expand um, an opening. It's, it's gonna help you with, with those failure modes. Uh, it can reduce uplift and port pressure down here at the toe because you're, you're reducing seepage. You're changing, you're changing that, that seepage regime. So grouting, um, we'll touch a little more on this afternoon too, but it, it, it's a broad topic. Um, again, this is something that's come a long ways uh, 
in the last 30 years. You know, up until about 30, 40 years ago, uh, most of your grout mixes were cement and water, and the solution was, well, just make it a thinner mix and pump the grout farther, and they have issues, they, those weren't stable, they wouldn't set up, they didn't, they wouldn't age well. The new, new balanced uh, mixes do much, much, much better. So, but you gotta think about, okay, is your foundation groutable? When you're grouting, you're grouting discontinuities, fractures, joints. You're not really grouting the rock mass, that, that matrix permeability. So you gotta make sure that that's what your issues are out here, and usually it is. Um, standard is a triple row grout curtain. So you downstream row, upstream row, and a center row, all angled at different directions so that you can uh, make sure you're trying to get as many of those discontinuities in the foundation as possible. A lot of great references on grouting. Um, Reclamation, Corps of Engineers, uh, this Weaver and Bruce book is really good. It's from 2007. It's, it's a really good and really easy to read book. I already talked about the different grout types, high mobility versus low mobility. Again, high mobility is filling those fractures, joints. That's your grout curtain. Low mobility is compaction grouting, consolidates the foundation. It can give you some strength improvement. It also does reduce hydraulic conductivity, much shorter travel distance. So I want to spend a few minutes on Hoover Dam. Yes, I know this is not an embankment dam, but there was a lot learned at Hoover related to grouting and, and actually uplift also for dams. So when, when they were planning out Hoover Dam in the 20s, they did, they did some extra borings on the side and they did shallow borings, but only one deep boring in the valley bottom. It went well into bedrock. They were trying to chase a certain bedrock type, um, but not a lot of investigation. They did do mapping of the sidewalls. Most of the river bottom was covered with sediment, so they didn't map there. And they did some, some crude percolation tests. So those were just gravity um, tests in, in the bedrock to estimate seepage losses. None of them were, they didn't pressurize anything, so they weren't looking at anything near what the hydraulic head would be from the reservoir imposed in that foundation. And Dave Rogers' web, web page is down here. He's got a lot of great presentations on Hoover Dam, just dams in general. He's a professor at, in uh, Missouri. Um, if you ever get a chance to hear him talk, take it. He's an exciting presenter. And he's got a, just a wealth of knowledge. So a good reference for you to kind of look at when you're, when you're bored sometime. So this is the foundation geology of Hoover. It's all pretty much, um, we got some, some breccias and some, some volcanic rocks. What, what you want to look at here is there's a lot of faults, these heavy dark lines. And the thin lines are a bunch of shears. So these shears are going upstream to downstream, a lot of cross canyon faulting. There's lots of discontinuities in the foundation. So their, their grouting program was a single line. Um, 100 to 125 feet deep, that's 14 to 21 percent of the dam height. Usually you try to target at least around 50 percent of your hydraulic head for your grout curtain as a rule of thumb. It can definitely be deeper than that. They did this grouting and the second year of operation, 1937, they saw significant seepage to the water coming out of the canyon walls downstream of the dam, water coming in around um, some of these penstocks that they weren't anticipating and it was it was acidic water, so it was doing a lot of corrosion. So in 1938, they started doing did some investigation. Said, "Well, our curtain's too shallow." Well, the dam is built, so they went in. They had a they had a grout gallery and a drainage gallery, and they went in and they had to do grouting for nine years in conditions like this. So, I guess pre OSHA, no hat, no hat, but um, it, it was it was tight working conditions. Now it, it did it did work, and, and their end game was. Here's our new grout curtain all the way down here. You know, it's 300 feet. And they pumped this at reservoir head. Um, this is a very hard rock. That was more to move stuff out. You need to be careful with grout pressure so you don't hydraulically fracture things. But um, this rock is a pretty low risk of that. And it, it had great, great improvement, great benefits. Again, nine year program. So this blue line up here, that was the uplift pressures after the dam was built. So you have uplift way above the toe. If this dam wouldn't have been an arched gravity section, it would have had much bigger issues and potentially, I don't know, failed, but it would have been really bad. And then here's their, their profile after the grouting. So it, it did work, it was, it was highly successful. And then core trenches, I've been talking on and off about those all day. Um, this is again, up your, your seepage, your main seepage barrier for a lot of these embankment dams, get it down into bedrock. So conclusions. So foundation shaping, cleaning, it's really crucial for, for rock foundations and abutments because we got to you know, take, take care of all these, these low stress zones. Um, and CLE, it's just, it's key. And, and again, these project back into the embankment. 
Uh, dewatering is pretty much always required. You're in a river valley or you're in an existing dam, you're in rehab, you're definitely gonna have to do dewatering. And whatever you pick, make sure it fits for your site and you're not introducing new failure modes. And I, that's kind of sometimes hard to think about, but make sure we're not making things worse. And it's really critical for long-term performance. And then again, as I said earlier, this goes all the way through construction. So this is not a uh, one and done. You are, till the dam's done, you're still working on foundation design and treatment. So learning objectives, we defined all these things. 